Thank you for joining us. Panel two is going to address the issue of extremism and digital media. As I mentioned in the introduction to our summit today, we often hear, is it social media? Is it the internet? Is it gaming? Is it really? So today I'm joined by not only some experts who are in this domain, but a victim of that online extremist violence that can happen which we often discount because we're so concerned with the kinetic attacks, we forget about this <clears throat> entire world that exists out there virtually. So by way of introduction, I'm, I'm Errol Southers again, and I'm gonna let my panelists self-introduce and talk a little bit about their respective organizations. Thank you so much, Errol, and thanks for organizing this and, and drawing attention to such an important topic. I'm Joanna Mendelson. I'm the Senior Investigative Researcher and Director of Special Projects for the Anti-Defamation League, and I've been with ADL for almost 20 years now. Um, ADL is a leading anti-hate organization, and it was founded on a very, very, um, in, in a climate of anti-Semitism and bigotry, and it's the timeless mission to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and secure justice and fair treatment for all rings true, unfortunately, to today in, in, in ways that are pretty uh, disastrous and, 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 and disheartening. So ADL, in our effort, in our 26 regional offices, monitors hate, tries to spotlight it and bring it to the forefront, create legislation to address and have those tools in order to deal with hate, mm -hmm. and to work with law enforcement to help protect the safety and security and spotlight extremist activity as it, as it roots both online and in the real world. So I'm part of the Center on Extremism, mm -hmm. and we are a mighty team uh, across the country. Each one of us is gathering intelligence information and partnering with law enforcement to raise awareness to, to basically be left of bank. A uh, law enforcement officer brought that to my attention, and, and essentially it's, it's that concept of before there is a headline, before there is that disastrous news, how can we spotlight and, uh, and address and undermine and essentially disrupt these groups from operating um, and carrying out some disastrous attacks in our country. I do want to thank you for your work. As you know, we've worked together for years, and I follow you, and I have to say, the saying we have here at the Saul Price School is without data, you're just another person with an opinion. We get a lot of that data from you, and I want to thank you for your efforts. Thank you. So, Rick, you're at Simon Wiesenthal, and self-introduce and tell us what you do. Uh, my name is Rick Eaton. I'm a senior researcher with the Simon Wiesenthal Center. Uh, we are a human rights organization that was formed in 1977 with the uh, mandate of uh, using the lessons of the Holocaust to apply to the, the situations of today. And uh, we have offices in, in around the U.S. and in four other countries. Uh, we combat bigotry, hate, racism, and anti-Semitism. Uh, we do a variety of different things. My job and is uh, for the past 34 years, and I'm so old that I predate digital. I, my first job was to subscribe to hard copy hate publications and communicate with groups, but uh, that put us in, in good position to take advantage uh, when the digital age came along, uh, even back in the 1980s, long before the World Wide Web. Uh, so we were we were tracking extremists and extremist groups on on uh, the the pre-web uh, digital communication and and uh, started uh, immediately with the first website in in 1995. We produce a report called Digital Terror and Hate, which is online and available to anyone, which tries to encapsulate what goes on with the uh, uh, with the digital era. Try to to uh, let people know about new platforms and and how the internet is is being used, as well as about uh, hate sites literally all over the world, wherever wherever we find them, and terrorism as well. We we uh, do that. Uh, my job is besides producing uh, all 21 reports, uh, digital terror and hate. Uh, I also uh, I also do law enforcement training. I've worked on a dozen uh, training videos with California Post and DHS, and uh, also done some, some interesting work in, in meeting uh, uh, interesting people at different times, not necessarily, uh, uh, not necessarily the most savory people around. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
And Taylor, again, I want to thank you for being with us today. It's an honor and a privilege to have you here. You come to us in a very unique way. Uh, you become a champion for me when I talk about this space, and what people can do to fight back. Again, just let people know who you are. And, and throughout the course of this panel, I really do want you to share your story about what happened and, and how you were able to overcome that challenge or that threat that came to you. Thank you so much, Errol. My name is Taylor Dumpson, and I am a current law school student, um, but I'm also a racially motivated hate crime survivor and online cyber harassment target. Um, I became the first black woman to become student government president on the campus of American University in their 124 year history. Mm -hmm. um, my first day in office, somebody hung bananas from nooses on my campus, from lampposts and from bus stops. And then within four days, um, and leading neo-Nazi Andrew Englin published an article about me publishing my photograph, my Facebook page, and link to the social media for the American University student government um, and encourage his followers to give me a warm welcome um, to, in my fight against bananas. Mm -hmm. um, and what ended up happening from that was that his followers understood that to mean him inciting a troll storm, mm -hmm. which meant that he was encouraging them to go out of their way to harass me online. Um, luckily enough, I was able to have support from the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, the Washington Lawyers Committee, and the law firm of Kirkland and Ellis. And we were able to hold those, um, those online harassers accountable. We sued Andrew Ang we, we sued Moonbase Holdings. We sued two other named defendants in that litigation. Um, luckily um, for us, we were able to win a favorable judgment in that case against three of the named defendants. Um, but we also had a restorative justice settlement with another defendant. And I think that that's something that I'm really proud of. Congratulations. Living proof that the system can work. So I do want to step back for a moment because, as I said, we typically talk about extremism. We talk about extremist violence. <clears throat> and there's this pivot, if you will, when these events are covered well. It's the Internet. It's social media. They're, we don't really have a problem in America. They're just online, and, and it's not as deep as you think. There's a whole world out there of on, an online subculture, if you will. What does this digital landscape look like? And I'm going to start with you, Joanna. Just give us a picture, if you will. So the landscape has changed drastically, right, from, from what Rick spoke about in terms of how the primary motivation and primary engagement occurred in the real world. Mm -hmm. And now we're seeing that the methodology of contact and radicalization occurs online. It's in the virtual space. And we have individuals who are deeply enmeshed with this virtual space. They are engaged in the ideology, in the memes, in, in kind of like a, a fire Fire hose of information that is flooding them with conspiracy theories and hatred. And that is in, uh, basically creating this individual, uh, kind of forming and molding and shaping uh, someone who is armed with such hate. And you look no further than the Charleston shooter, okay. someone who um, never actually had real world experience with uh, an organization. And yet he was one of the kind of consumers of online hatred. Um, he absorbed messages of Council of Conservative, Conservative Citizens. He looked at current events in order to kind of frame the narrative. And that led him to hate, to the murderous actions of nine African Americans gunned down as they, as they were in church. And so this to us is the new landscape. This is how they are organizing, how they are radicalizing. And one of the very unique elements of this, and especially it's been magnified with the, the onset of the alt-right, mm -hmm. but essentially they are creating an us versus them narrative and a language in which they're communicating, um, us versus them, so that there's an inside group. We're called the normies. We are normies because we buy into current thought. Mm -hmm. But they believe that they, uh, they have this language that they've seen the light. They've been red-pilled, for example, that they have consumed and absorbed a reality uh, that the Jews control the world, that Jews are invecting their conspiracy, whether or not it's liberalism or multiculturalism or diversity, and they are bringing down and threatening the white race. Mm -hmm. And so they use meme culture and they invect it with uh, bigotry, sarcasm, racist humor. And it all is in that kind of lower level joking and mockery. But yet it has enormous impact. These bite-sized visualizations of hate reaffirm the message to a global audience. And that is exactly uh, kind of the, the subculture that's uh, emerging online. So 
we see this as we talk about the three elements. You've got this alienated individual. You've got this, in their world, this legitimizing ideology. Does, in fact, that enabling community, that third component, become a virtual community that supports them? Absolutely. In, in some ways, co-conspirators in this larger movement, uh, participants in helping to promote that ideology, mm -hmm. help to reach out and tap into those who do feel alienated, who do feel like they have become the other, who, who uh, adolescents who feel that they are not fully uh, um, in, involved, uh, fully uh, um, embraced in their own life. And this online community welcomes them. It creates a brotherhood. It creates a, a cause in some ways um, that they can connect with others who maybe share or appreciate uh, how they may not fit in mm -hmm. exactly. Hmm. So Rick, you two, you, obviously we've, we've known each other for quite a few years and you've been at Simon Wiesenthal and really seen an evolution of this online domain how does it, how does that happen how has it happened and and why is it so more effective now i think one of the things is as joanna said it, it's changed radically but back in 1995 when the world wide web came along mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot of hope and promise that this was the place for uh, the white supremacy movement they weren't even calling themselves white nationalists at the time and in fact just yesterday i dug up an old quote that uh, from uh, uh, Tony McAleer, who's on our next panel, about getting online and, and blasting off into cyberspace and trying to urge their followers. But what has happened uh, over the years, and it took a long time, the, 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 the promise and the hope that they had this would be their great recruiting tool, mm -hmm. uh, has now come into uh, its own mainly because of social media. Although there were instantaneous ways to communicate with people now with social media uh, and a combination of things because this so-called alt-right that, that Joanna mentioned is, has been a big part of it. For the 40 years previous to 2005, you had a handful of people that led the white, the white nationalist movement, the white supremacy movement. You had a lull in there and around 2014, 2015, you had a whole new generation of young people who were internet savvy, that they knew all these new platforms and things like that, and, and how to communicate to each other, whereas this old guard that was around for so long, really, they, they, they had their sites, but they really weren't used to using the platforms and, and the like. So you had that change, and this whole, this young generation, people like Richard Spencer and Andrew Anglin that, that was <coughs> mentioned are, are people that, that grew up with this, with this medium and, and knew how to use it, and social media in general has just brought it all together. Mm -hmm. uh, the good news in terms of landscape is that that the major providers, Facebook and YouTube and, and, and Google uh, and, and uh, Twitter, have only mainly since Charlottesville mm -hmm. gotten the message that they are part of the problem. Mm -hmm. And while there's still a lot of work to do, uh, they have taken this seriously. They've taken a lot of material offline, uh, but then that, that leads to other sites, which we'll, we'll probably talk about. Uh, and it leads to other issues, too, as we always are faced with those who come back at us and say, well, I have a First Amendment right to do this. I, I, can, I can be hateful. I can be racist. And, and, and why can't I espouse that online? Taylor, I want you to talk about that landscape, especially being on a college campus, as we are now when that happened. And, and how did that look to you? And, and what do you think it's evolved into? So as somebody who's grown up, I was born in 1996. So I've grown up with technology and the Internet my entire life. Um, and so it's something that is in trenched into your everyday fabric as somebody that is in this young generation. Um, what I think it looks like, I actually have some quotes if you don't mind me reading. Please. Um, and this is going from Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, um, and even on the phone. I usually wouldn't use such graphic language, but I think it's important to kind of highlight what it is that they are saying and, and what this actually looks like tangibly. Quote, how many more bananas and how much more rope is it going to take to make this all stop? A call on campus, May 4th, 2017. Quote, everybody bring bananas, ready the troops. With a link to the live stream that I was facilitating on campus at the exact moment in time that I was there. On Twitter, May 4th, 2017. Negress Taylor dumps in to receive special police protection. Twitter, May 2017. 
Quote, nigger agitator gets police bodyguards because of Daily Stormer. Andrew Anglin, Daily Stormer, May 2017. Quote, I'll take a few years for painting the street in her blood. Just smash her in the head with a bike lock hard enough to split her head open with a wound that needed stitches. I've seen that you only get probation for that offense. YouTube, December 2018. Quote, you have no idea how much I hate you and I hate people like you. You make the world an unsafe place. Instagram, December 2018. <clears throat> Quote, what a weak woman. I think it's hilarious that a banana hung in a tree is so scary. I wish I knew her address. I would send her a noose so she could go hang herself and do the world a favor. She's absolutely pathetic. YouTube, last week. Quote, them bitches fake. They ain't hung you yet? YouTube, two days ago. And so this is the world in which we live in. This is an online mm -hmm. onslaught. And so online harassment is absolutely no different than in-person harassment. And in some ways, it's more pervasive and more evasive because you've got people hiding behind a cloak of anonymity. They're all over the place. You have no idea where they are. Um, but it's constant in the same way that you have a 24-hour news cycle. It's the exact same way with the internet. And so it is not as if it was a one-off situation. It's not like Andrew Englund just encouraged him to troll me once mm -hmm. every time I speak anytime I do something anytime you see progressivism happening across the country you will see the white supremacists and white nationalists and white and neo-nazis coming up and pushing back against that and it looks like this and when you're talking about meme culture um, when Andrew England had posted the link to my uh, or posted an article about me one of the memes that I saw when I read through the comments that first day was a meme of Pepe the Frog that's mm -hmm. they love him mm -hmm. um, and it was a meme of Pepe the Frog but holding a gun to the back of the head of a caricature of a black person with straight back braids. I wear braids. I am black. Like, what a, what kind of message is that supposed to send? Because it's not as if you don't know where the, you know, it's not as if these are not real things. This is very, very real. And it has real world impacts. Um, due to the uh, onslaught of death threats, racial harassment, gender based harassment that I received, I lost 20 pounds of my body weight. That is 15% of my total weight. I weighed 125 pounds by the time that I was in college. I had weighed 120 pounds consistently from the seventh grade to my senior year of high school. Mm -hmm. That meant that the weight that I was after the hate crime, I was the same weight in the sixth grade. That's unreal and un unimaginable. So people talk about, well, you know, just get offline. Just, you know, go away. You know, if you can't handle it, get out the kitchen mm -hmm. kind of thing. But this is the digital forum. This is how we receive our information. And this is the world in which millennials and young people are growing up in. And so it's not as if you can just remove yourself from the situation. You're missing news. I mean, this is this is where you get your, your news from. And so I've had to limit my online. Um, I've had to limit my online speech and expression. Mm -hmm. because of neo-Nazis and white supremacists and the threats and the very real threats that they pose. And so these online platforms have an obligation not just to protect freedom of expression and freedom of speech, but they also owe an obligation to their users, irrespective of their race and gender and their identity, to still be able to use their platforms in the same way that any other person can. Do you want to respond? Wow. Yeah, you know, Taylor, you are so brave, and, and thank you for sharing your story, and, and you have been such an advocate and, and such a champion of, uh, instead of, uh, you know, shriveling away, you've gone out there and you've doubled down, and I think you are a beautiful presence kind of shedding light on this issue. You define the victim, like you are the face of somebody who is behind all of that hate. And what we see is the weaponization of hate and the detriment of that. The ability to use online technology to create a troll storm, to draw attention and to flag. Um, it, is, it is my colleagues that brought to your attention the fact that he was targeting you and, and kind of brought that to light um, because it's, it's a, a form, a platform that, that that we have been tracking for, for a very long time. And what we're seeing is that they are using technology in order to broadcast their message to a global audience and their ability to not just communicate to those in their vicinity, but those in an, an international forum is something mm -hmm. and to capitalize on that. So whether or not, you know, we see them in the mainstream platforms, as, as Rick mentioned, but what we're seeing and more increasingly is that as they move from these mainstream platforms, as we ask that our platforms are more responsible, we have in some ways a double-edged sword 
because now they're going to these echo chambers. They're going to places like Gab or like the Chans, these lion dens of hate that they are empowered with their anonymity, with the way that they can boldly communicate their ideology without fear of retribution. Um, and, um, and, and we're seeing them be able to magnify their hate. Even more challenging is their uh, kind of migration to encrypted chats, whether or not it's on Wire or Discord, um, or even on the dark web, where now we're seeing many of these groups operate. And so that becomes as a safety and security issue. How do we respond with policy that reflects the reality? ADL did a study and we saw that if you documented every time Twitter deplatformed these extremists, we saw a spike in Gab. Mm. And it correlated. And Gab are these echo chambers where they're not getting um, the messages um, challenged. They're not getting their messages refuted. And it's all feeding into this larger cult, uh, subculture. Mm -hmm. And I think that presents to us one of the greatest issues. The, uh, yeah, there are many echo chambers like Gab, a site that was started in 2016, very late in the in the election cycle when a lot of people were being tossed off of, of sites like Twitter and others. But in the last uh, year and a half or so, we've we've also seen other platforms that they've been going to and things that are that are uh, populated by by normal people as well just this year uh, a site called iFunny which is which is mainly memes uh, which a lot of young people uh, subscribe to and look at uh, we have another one called parlor which is which is uh, uh, open. It's not. It's not just extremists, but we're seeing the extremists go there. Uh, as Joanna mentioned, Discord is being used for chat, but also for gaming. As is Steam. Gaming has become a place where there are so many people on it, so many young people, uh, that they they look for people to recruit there and and can communicate even inside a game while it's being played, mm -hmm. uh, and try to find people who might be uh, might be susceptible to their message. Uh, and just in the way some games, some very mainstream games are used and the team names that are created and things like that, there's, there are all these influences that are being spread through these, all these different mediums. So that was the bad news on, uh, about the Internet. And it's, it's each, each one that, that goes to address their, their issues and is, is contacted by the ADL or at Simon Wiesenthal Center or other organizations, then they'll find a new one to go to. Mm -hmm. uh, and the same thing with these encrypted chats, each one trying to outdo each other on just how, uh, how safe they can be for extremists. A site called SureSpot uh, which says, you know, we don't save anything. We somebody comes with a warrant, we have no information to give them. Mm. Some years ago, I was able to use SureSpot when I downloaded it. Within five minutes, I was talking to an ISIS soldier in Syria. So, if a Jewish guy in his office in Los Angeles can do that, how about somebody who's interested mm -hmm. in whatever type of extremism we're talking about? Right. So, there, these platforms keep coming, and there, there's always somebody in Silicon Valley that's that's sitting in a Starbucks trying to create the new the new platform that everybody will use, and they'll make a lot of money. So, I guess what is even more particularly disturbing, we know that we've got some groups that won't be named today who are local to us here who have traveled overseas, they've, they've connected with people abroad. You have a, a recent report come out of ADL, I believe it was called the Internationalization of White Supremacy. What can be done to address these online platforms? And, and I know you're all working on it, but if you wouldn't mind sharing some of the things that are being done to um, redirect some of this kind of activity. So ADL just commissioned a study that found that 37% of individuals, adults, mm -hmm. online, have experienced severe harassment or hate online. And that is, that's o over a third. Yeah. That's pretty significant. And so we have to figure out ways in which we can make our platforms more responsible and respond to this new, new form of hate. Mm -hmm. um, so we've launched a program called Backspace Hate. It's an initiative that's nationwide. 
Um, and California is certainly one of the states that we're looking to really dive in as a, a kind of a pilot state. Mm -hmm. And what we've seen is that the laws do not reflect what is occurring online. We need to catch up. In fact, we need to change the legislative landscape to reflect the current times, to help support and, and protect victims like you, Taylor, who find themselves at, at the, you know, in the crosshairs of these extremist, uh, the, the ire of, uh, from these groups. And so the, the initiative aims to identify every state and the laws that they have on the books mm -hmm. and figure out the loopholes in which they can tighten and give, uh, make the perpetrators responsible for their, um, their activity. Mm -hmm. So it involves focus on swatting focus it on, on um, cyber hate, a focus on um, non-consensual uh, nude photos, all of these other types of attacks that they, that they wage at, to use as, at, at their disposal to target and to express their hatred. Mm -hmm. And so ADL is very proud of the fact that we are, are, are doing this across the country, needing the community's help to legislate, to advocate. It's all mapped out online and what kind of tools are available online in each state and see where we need to tighten it up. Mm -hmm. And to that point, another way to do that is through litigation, and that's kind of where my lawsuit kind of falls in Excellent. really neatly. Mm -hmm. um, we were able to bring a lawsuit in suing the defendants, um, but it was rooted in um, public accommodations law. So we use the D.C. Human Rights Act um, as the basis for that, which basically says that you can't interfere with somebody's equal enjoyment of a protected act mm -hmm. underneath of that law. And so by definition, that meant that my education was protected under the D.C. Human Rights Act because American University is a private school, yes, but it also is a national arboretum. It has a parking garage, swimming pools, parks that are accessible to the general public. That meant that because I had to alter my entire routines and everything that limited my ability to truly engage on my campus, we were able to hold Andrew Anglin and the other followers um, and Moonbase Holdings accountable to that because by them instructing and, and following up on Andrew Anglin's you know, request to give me a warm welcome, um, what that ended up happening was it impacted my ability to get an education, it impacted my ability to go to school, and it impacted my ability to use the resources that American University has. And so that's the first time, to the best of our knowledge, that um, a, a court has held that online racial harassment can interfere with someone's use of public accommodation, so in the physical. And so that kind of shows that online harassment is not just online, it transcends into the physical. And so that meant that that's a, it's a new avenue um, and possibly a new blueprint for people people and survivors to use um, to sort of push back and to be able to hold white supremacists accountable. A tremendously important precedent and again I want to applaud you. There must have been an incredible team of support if you wouldn't mind just sharing perhaps how that came together. Yes, so I actually had the opportunity to intern at the Lawyers Committee with their Stop Hate Project. Mm -hmm. And in seeing a lot of um, the work that they do, we also recognized that by the time that I graduated from American University that last semester, the Department of Justice had been investigating at home, um, Department of Justice, um, the FBI, the Washington um, Metropolitan Police Department, and Public Safety had been investigating it, but no one could find who hung the physical nooses on my campus. Mm -hmm. And so in that space, I was looking for a way to hold somebody, the only people that I could hold accountable, accountable, um, which meant that I was able to kind of think of and think through, you know, who else is left? Andrew Anglin, the Daily Stormer, the people that trolled me online. And so it was really from that kind of perspective that we were like, cool, now what do we need to do? Mm -hmm. And so that looked like suing um, the Daily Stormer and Andrew Anglin. Um, and it's really interesting because it's a unique kind of perspective. I'm not the only person who's ever sued Andrew Anglin. There are two other cases that were won recently. Um, both of them received favorable judgments, and I'm so proud of that. Um, Tanya Gersh is a Jewish woman out of White Whitefish, Montana, mm -hmm. who was targeted by Andrew Anglin. Dino Badala is a comedian and talk show host on Sirius XM. He was targeted by Andrew Anglin on that website. And so all of us were able to bring these kinds of cases, those two cases were rooted in torts and rooted in um, intentional infliction of emotional distress. And while my case was also about intentional infliction of emotional distress, mm -hmm. it had the unique lens of public accommodations because I was I a student. I see. So Rick, again, what kinds of things is Simon Wiesenthal, I know you've done this for quite some time, addressing this online subculture, what kinds of tools have been effective and what is sort of a best practice, if you will? 
The main one, I think, is still the fact that most Internet providers do have some forms of terms of service that you have to agree to. Mm -hmm. And what we and other organizations do is try to meet with these, with these uh, Internet companies, uh, try to help them shape their policy. Some are more receptive than others, but in many cases, either hold them to their terms of service or get them to... To, and it, uh, they changed greatly just in the last, just in this past year. YouTube has, has changed theirs significantly. Facebook is always changing theirs. Uh, and it's holding these organizations to their, their own uh, rules. And that is one of the most effective. And they don't like the publicity uh, as much as you know. There's, there's a daily story about Facebook in terms mm -hmm. of uh, data breaches or... <clears throat> A release of uh, information or things that they, you know, privacy issues and, and so forth. They don't like those stories. Mm -hmm. They don't like to hear about it. Uh, and as bad as we sometimes hear about, Facebook was also the first one that really took online hate and terrorism seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't always remove people and remove sites, but uh, again, things that they weren't removing uh, three years ago they're doing now. I, I think we have another problem because there's the, the issue of the upline providers. And in the case of, of Andrew Anglin and Daily Stormer, the day after Charlottesville, uh, uh, Andrew Anglin was, was deplatformed by his, by his upline provider. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of other sites, including Stormfront, the oldest uh, white supremacist site online, which started back as a BBS, uh, but those, those have come back. Uh, Gab was also deplatformed for a short time um, in, uh, I believe it was right after the, the uh, Pittsburgh uh, Tree of Life shooting. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but most of those have come back online. Andrew Anglin has had to fight to find places, going to the dark web and the like. And, and uh, I think that we need to do that to all these people. If they, they may still be able to get online, but make it difficult on them, make it difficult on, on people that want to find this material to get to them. His, he used to boast that he was even the, the biggest white nationalist site online before Charlottesville, and now people are having trouble finding him. I'd like to keep, keep that trend up. Mm -hmm. So what about First Amendment issues? I, I remember years ago when you and I used to talk about Matt Hale and the World Church of the Creator and, and them being online and some of the games they were pushing. Um, when do they cross that line? I mean, do they have a right to be online? What happens when they get taken down? Is this really working? I, I think in some respects it is changing. The uh, 20 years ago, or more than 20 years ago, when, when we first testified in Congress about, about this issue, they, they, the FCC was not really familiar with digital. They weren't prepared for it. Uh, uh, people in Congress did not want to hear anything about First Amendment issues and, and the like. They're, they're starting to, to change that and, and think about how do we go about this. Uh, I, I think there will always be First Amendment issues. People have the right right to to say what they want to to a point, uh, but I, I think we need a more responsible. As I said previously, we need a more responsible attitude from from the inter, the social media providers, the upline providers, and and even some who had 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 been contacted previously and, and said, you know, we're, we're just a pass-through, we don't have anything to do with it, they're starting to get the message that, that maybe there's a problem here. Mm -hmm. and, and to that end, if you look at 8chan, this is one of the purveyors that was linked to individuals who would post their manifesto mm -hmm. and carry out the most murderous actions. We look at Christchurch, and then you follow that thread all the way through, where that really kind of changed the landscape of weaponization of Mm -hmm. of posting a live stream incident. Not only was the perpetrator preparing his weapons, but simultaneously preparing for these co-conspirators, for these others who will then seed this 
this video, this horrific video through all the corners of the earth uh, and the web in that case. We saw that then uh, translate to Poway. Mm -hmm. Although he failed in that effort to live stream, that was his, his interest. And he posted his manifesto on 8chan. We saw that with El Paso, and then we saw that most recently with Hal, uh, Germany, in, for, uh, over Yom Kippur, where a synagogue was targeted. And so we see this ability to take hate and try to push it out there in almost like a video game content. Yeah. You know, it, it's, if you watch, and, and I, I don't wish it upon anyone because I've been doing this for so long, but I say the, the content from Christchurch is just disgusting. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's awful. And the perpetrator in his um, almost like robotic way as he approaches victims, women and children gunned down as they pray, it, it certainly uh, um, leaves a, a horrible uh, lasting impression. But this is exactly what they're tr attempting to do, mm -hmm. to gain followers using that gamification mm -hmm. and also identify how many kills did you get? Game over. All of those references you see weaved into their subculture of hate. Mm -hmm. um, the other element I do want to say is in addition to legislation, in addition to tech companies, law enforcement are such a critical component to this fight. And the aggressiveness in which we have seen um, numerous incidents being addressed is, is certainly telling. Tree of Life anniversary, the most anti-Semitic incident in the history of our country, mm -hmm. where 11 people were killed as they pray. Um, we, saw, uh, we saw a number of incidents happen since then. 19 white supremacists have been arrested by law enforcement since this one year anniversary, mm -hmm. who targeted all different groups. 13 of them targeted Jews or synagogues. And we have luckily, uh, ADL has assisted in four of those 13 arrests mm -hmm. or providing critical intelligence information that led to that arrest. Mm -hmm. Just this past weekend, we saw in Colorado a historic synagogue. Um, one individual wanted to attack it with dynamite and pipe bombs. And luckily, federal authorities safeguarded our community. So that is really another component to responding to the online hate. It really is. Uh, you know the incident in El Paso on August 3rd, between August 3rd and September 1st, there were 27 people arrested because people called law enforcement. They saw something, they heard something, they read something that was real, that really didn't sit well with them and they called, so that does work. And I know, Rick, you wanted to make a comment, but I... Yeah, Joanna mentioned live streaming. We are now three and a half years down the road from the murder of a, a French policeman and his companion by a terrorist Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. uh, the internet companies are either unwilling or unable to address the issue. We've called on them time and again to do something about this or even and stop this or even explain why is live streaming so important uh, that we can't, we can't find a solution to this. And, they, and our calls have gone on, fell on deaf ears. Mm -hmm. I also want to pivot to two things. Number one, Taylor, what might be happening in the way of our college campuses in educating students when these things happen and what to do? That's one issue. And then I specifically want to go to some instances where we've had some parents um, who are Jewish whose sons have gravitated to ideologies that we wouldn't think would be acceptable. So, Taylor, what's happening in the college Yes, campus. the way that I see it is that, uh, and the way I talk about it a lot, is that colleges and universities um, weren't really prepared for what was going to happen after Brown v. Board. And so when you demand that these schools are desegregated and you put all these people in rooms otherwise that would not have been in those rooms, you have to seriously think through what does it mean to make sure that everybody has the same opportunity to be included in that, to be able to share their perspectives, to be able to engage in that space. And because schools were not prepared to do that, they've not really truly, in my opinion, thought through what are the next steps? How then do we protect students? Because then there's, there are the combinations. A lot of schools and universities will say, well, we protect freedom of speech. But then they don't remember the fact that students live there. Students of color also live on their campuses. They have students from all sorts of different backgrounds and races and ethnicities and religions and sexual orientations that they also owe an obligation to. And so the way that I see it is that schools and universities, they have an obligation to their students because their students live there.
there. And mm -hmm. so I, what I don't see happening a lot of these times in those conversations, I mean, I'm not in those rooms all the time, but what I don't see talk, being talked about is that schools have students living there. This is like somebody burning a, a cross on your front yard. There is no distinction between that when it comes to your campus. In the time that I was a student at American University, there was a bias-related incident that happened every single semester in the eight semesters I was there, including the semester after the mm -hmm. uh, bananas were hung from nooses. Mm -hmm. That following semester, cotton bushels and Confederate flags were posted on the Israeli Studies sign on our campus the same night as the AU Anti-Racism and Research Policy Center was opened. And so we're seeing schools and progressive institutions being targeted by outside people coming into their campuses. Mm -hmm. American University, in that instance, um, the, the person that hung those uh, cotton bushels and, and um, Confederate flags was wearing a construction uniform. He was wearing a bright yellow jacket. He was wearing a, a construction hat. This is the world that we're seeing. Schools and universities are being targeted by outside um, alt-right people, and they're being targeted on their campuses, and it's showing up in real time. And so I don't see universities really thinking through what does that support mechanism look like for students. Mm -hmm. And so what I wish it would look like is making sure that mental health resources are at the foremost of the conversation, making sure that students that are in classes or have exams get extensions so that students are able to actually focus on their education because you can't think about enjoying your education or your college experience if you're concerned about your safety. Mm -hmm. People can't learn if they're concerned about real problematic things that impact their everyday life. Mm -hmm. I teach uh, homegrown violent extremism here in the spring, and we had a very interesting discussion around the subject of a, an outed white supremacist on campus and whether or not he should be here because he had all but made threats and people knew who he was and there were people who were uncomfortable. They were, felt very nervous and unsafe. And it was a very interesting debate about his rights and their rights to be in the same space at the same time knowing how he felt about them. But Joanna, I do want to go to some other elements that have happened more recently that seem very interesting, I'll, I'll just use that term, with regards to Jewish young men, specifically, who have drifted toward, in some instances, uh, neo-Nazi ideologies and something like that. Sure. Let's let's even pull back further, right? So Taylor uh, addressed some of the incidents on campus. We're seeing middle schoolers, we're seeing young kids who are glomming onto what they're absorbing online mm -hmm. and acting out. So we have here in California, in Ojai, middle schoolers formed a human swastika. We have in Orange County, a group of kids on the weekend made solo cups out of the shape of a swastika. Another uh, incident in an Orange County school where they're doing a Nazi Say salute uh, at, at, their, at their team. On Chapman University, we see examples of white supremacy and flyers and leafleting. And we're seeing them target young people. In fact, in California, we are the largest state in the nation for white supremacist propaganda by a number of different groups mm -hmm. that are trying to push their agenda. So one, they target college campuses because they, they lambast the, the liberal bastion, right. the indoctrination in the future generation, mm -hmm. but they're also looking to recruit to target and so they're getting into kind of the clutches of young people mm -hmm. and that's exactly what we're seeing with some young people who perhaps naively or perhaps um, uh, by happenstance because of the communities that they're involved in whether or not it's on steam or in video in discord chats they're getting exposed to these messages and perhaps they're de downgrading the significance of it by saying it's just ironic Right. It's just bigotry. Mm -hmm. And so there's a great New York Times article that just came out, if I, if I could read it. It's, it's um, racists are recruiting, watch your white sons. And it was an opinion piece on October 12th, uh, written by Joanna Schroeder. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really a significant insight because it's not two dimensional. Your son your, is not gonna go online and suddenly become and take on these views. Right. But what it is, is it's that gradual process. The article, the opinion piece talked about how her son liked a Hitler meme. Mm -hmm. 
Mom, it's just irony. It's just bigoted humor. It's nothing. But that is exactly where we need to kind of address it at that point. Mm -hmm. Understand and paint the victim who's on the other side of that horrific meme right. to personalize it, to have them relate. Because that is ultimately, we have to teach them how to have that connection and understand their impact. Mm -hmm. um, the really sad part about that was she caught her son because he used a couple of terms that's often used in that space that she understood and he tried to wish it away but his mother was more technically savvy than he thought and she challenged him on it and that's when they had that discussion it's a really good article it's a really interesting piece we, we uh, at the center have have thought about this issue and especially with the issue that was mentioned with young people you know as young as middle school mm -hmm. and we've started uh, piloting a program called Combat Hate that, uh, that goes into the schools and talks to kids about social media, mm -hmm. something which the schools are really unprepared to deal with and how to go about it. So we've been piloting this program in, in mostly in Los Angeles, but also in New York and Chicago. And we created this program for a class at a time where we, we uh, talk to kids about their internet usage. Uh, we break them into groups. We give them a sample, a very mild, thing from not from any groups or anything like that but funny racist jokes or a meme or something like that have them talk about it within their groups uh, report back to the class what they found uh, talk about the consequences of hate and taking hate seriously mm -hmm. uh, and uh, again we hope that 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 will if not right at that moment maybe it'll take hold later on when they do see something offensive online mm -hmm. and try to get them to take it seriously which is the whole point of the program yeah. so I'm gonna I want to ask each of you in, in the final moments if there were one <clears throat> thing that you could offer in the way of advice particularly as we address the online digital issue what would you suggest we do would it be something that would go out to the community, to law enforcement, legislators? What would that one item that you would prioritize with regards to advice on a dealing with this most complex and increasingly challenging threat? I would say it's a package. Okay. I'd say if there's one thing, it's a package because this is a multi-pronged approach that we need to mm -hmm. come up with, um, that it requires solutions from every element of our society. So whether or not it's legislation to help curtail and close those loopholes, whether or not it's working with those tech companies to create solutions for people to report. Right now, it's a one-off. You click, you report a single site, but there's a large larger phenomenon and how do you communicate to the tech companies the types of attacks and concerns that you have? Mm -hmm. um, how do you make it more transparent online so that you have a greater voice when you are uh, the subject of these, these uh, trolling uh, storms? So legislative, law enforcement, partnering with law enforcement and, 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 and helping them flag particular issues that are operating online so that when they do cross over from First Amendment to, to uh, a specific and actual actionable offense that they can help uh, investigate and, and make an arrest. So it is a multi-part part element, but also education. Mm -hmm. And we always talk about that as the antidote to my work, because really we have to change the hearts and minds. We have to get to that next generation to have them not just embrace difference, not just tolerate, but learn how to navigate and, and, and fully embrace those differences mm -hmm. um, and learn how, to, uh, how that can enhance their life um, instead of being something that they are threatened uh, uh, for. Okay. Right. I, as I agree with Joanna. It's a, it's a, it's a multi-pronged problem. Uh, but I think one of the main things is we are we are reactive in these situations. You know, we, we whether we find material online after it's happened or we have one of these shootings, it's live streamed, whatever it is. And I think that we need to change the culture ahead of time. And that means getting uh, people who who know, understand education, understand education principles, uh, states. Uh, uh, talking to people, instituting curriculum that will address these issues long before they happen rather than wait till afterwards. Mm -hmm. okay. And I think that we truly have to lean into discomfort. I think that a lot of times people are uncomfortable speaking out when they see something online. They're uncomfortable bringing it to somebody else's attention, so they just sit there and they're just 
bystanders and they, they just let it keep going. Mm -hmm. And I think that until we start having these really critical conversations, whether that is at a Thanksgiving dinner table with people, you know, all across your family without all across ideological differences, whether that means going into your workspace and being able to talk about it, I think we truly have to, we have to talk about it as we see it where we are. We have to be able to do what we can where we are with what we've got because I think that a lot of people that need to hear the message and that we're talking about, we're preaching to the choir a lot of times. We're talking to people that already understand that, you know, hate crimes and these things are on the rise, but it's the people that are not in those spaces. So we have to bring those conversations to them because they might not otherwise go and seek those conversations. So I want to just close by saying again, thank you all for what you do. You've made it clear there's a couple things that resonated. Obviously, this is an interdisciplinary, re requires an interdisciplinary response to a very complex problem. And uh, one of education, I I'm going to certainly push for research that all of you do because research is so important. But last but not least, that community engagement and the support that you got and others get when these things happen, it doesn't happen without that. Because at the end of the day, while we're talking about the virtual world, we are talking about people. Mm -hmm. And people make this happen and people can reduce the risk of this happening. So, Joanna, thank you for your work. Rick, thank you for all the things that you do. And Taylor, for being such a champion and so courageous. You really set the bar high. Um, out there and let people know that they can do something. They don't have to sit back and be an unwilling victim. And I just want to, again, thank you all for joining us today and contributing to this very, very important panel. Thank, thank you, you. and thank thanks you. to you.